What's going on guys? I am here with Ms. Gia Elliott, the co-writer and director of the, would you say supernatural horror? I've been calling it a Riot Girl creature feature. Okay, I like that. Yeah. It's a uh, take back the night. I don't want to spoil this, uh, but just to kind of put this in perspective, this does for assault victims what grief did for, what the Babadook did for grief. Wow, that's an insanely high compliment. Yeah, so you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, first off, um, it's, I don't even know where to start because this movie is so layered and so complex and deals with so many spectacular themes. Um, first off, I don't know if you know this or not, um, but I did some Googling last night and there is also a, uh, this film does deal with sexual assault. Yeah. I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, there's also a sexual org. There's also an organization. Yes. Uh, called Take, Take Back the Night. Yes. Yeah. So they've been around since the '70s. They originally started on college campuses to organize to try to make it a safe space for women, which we're still working on. Um, and it's it's kind of been a banner of a slogan that sexual violence advocates sort of use. And so, you know, our. Um, us using the title is like a nod to suggest that this is by no means a subtle movie about sexual violence. I was I was curious about uh, if that had anything to, to do with uh, the the organization, or if it was like kind of. But I really enjoyed it um, that you guys were able to bring that nod into here. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, I really respect the history of the ground that we're standing on, and so I think to try to incorporate um, some nods was important to us. Can you kind of talk about where the film came from? Um, because it's you and Emma Emma Fitzpatrick. Emma Fitzpatrick that, that co-wrote this. She does such a wonderful job in this movie. Yeah. Emma could not be a more talented a actor. Um, I, I was very lucky that she decided to work with me. Uh, I had just dropped out of law school and I was in Los Angeles. It was very hell-bent on making um, content that felt fun and that felt, you know, um, entertaining and I had seen a lot of sexual violence cases in New York while I was sitting with a judge on a bench in a court um, in part of like my internship during law school and Emma was you know studying uh, how victims behave after they experience trauma like how the impact of trauma on the brain actually impacts your behavior and so we sort of started an ongoing dialogue you know, nights weekends we were just around the clock talking about it and so um, one thing led to another and I, I own a camera and so next thing I knew I was picking it up and teaching myself how to use it and Emma and I were trying to translate all the themes and thoughts that we were exploring um, you know just in our dialogue and trying to render them in cinema and that's sort of where the movie came from. Yeah so we, we've covered sexual assault awareness um, through some of the content that we've released and one of the things that I have family members that are uh, assault survivors yeah and so I grew up constantly around that kind of education but it's it's very rare that I feel like uh, justice is something that doesn't come a lot of times for these yes. kind of cases and I love that Emma's character is so driven to bring justice and kind of to uh, be you know proven that the what she experiences is real. Can you kind of ex explore kind of bringing that real life uh, injustice to the screen? Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your family. It's not an uncommon story. If, you know, statistically one in every five women experiences some form of sexual assault in her lifetime. And um, out of those five, a third of them are between the ages of 11 and 17 when they first experience it. Um, it's very cool to hear that your family has embraced a dialogue and you grew up with that kind of influence. I really hope that people um, can find ways to heal and feel healthy and feel like they can have those conversations with their own families. Um, our film, sort of the, the main justice I think that Jane is looking for is simply to be believed. And that's what she's chasing the entire film because you know, if you pursue a case through the legal system, sure, you can get somebody locked up or you can get somebody convicted, but how much is that gonna 
help you in your process. So I think for any survivor out there, obviously in the film we cover this too, but you know, if you report within 48 hours, you have the option of taking a PACE. Um, you, you, they perform a PACE exam on your body, which takes um, minimum six hours. You're naked basically the whole time. They scrape your whole body with a tongue depressor to get any like, you know, flakes of skin off of your body. They uh, go underneath all of your nails. They take a comb through your hair and they catch any DNA that might fall out. You get poked and prodded in places that are probably pretty sore. So it's like a whole re-traumatization. -tra and then you have to go through many different interviews with all these detectives and that's again another re-traumatization. So for some survivors, they decide that that actually doesn't feel like justice to them. They would like to heal in some other way. And I think all the ways that a survivor wants to heal are valid ways. And so just sort of exploring with Jane's particular drive was simply to be believed and so you know she tried it in the courts she tried it amongst her community and she tried it in her family and um, I guess I'll have to watch the movie to find out. Part of the reason that makes Jane's journey so heartbreaking is the fact that she really has to go to the ends of the earth to get someone to believe her and uh, there's a scene probably in like the tail end of the second half of the, the second yeah. act of the movie where she's being interrogated by the detective in the film and she's kind of explaining why uh, they need to have 100 percent you know proof that what she said happened actually happened yeah and uh, that is, I feel like it's kind of like really heartbreaking yeah and can you kind of ex explore like in your I guess from like more of like a, a legality side yeah of course so the difference between criminal and civil law in America is that to convict on a criminal charge, you have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. And what that means in practice is a doubt to which you can assign a reason. So in the O.J. Simpson case, the glove, right? So those jurors are like, I don't know, did the glove really not fit? Even if it looks like he did it, I have to say no because I have one reason that's a shadow of a doubt of why I'm gonna say that he didn't do it. And so convicting any case is very difficult. And the way that the cases are written are, um, clunky, you know, they've been, when litigator, when, um, sorry, when legislators are trying to make these laws, it's kind of an uphill battle and a fight and they're arguing over everything. And what that means is you get a lot of sloppy writing. You get commas in the wrong place. You get the word like forcible thrown in there. The word forcible is in your sexual assault language of the statute of what it requires um, to convict somebody. Like the definition of sexual assault, if it says forcible, it means that you're then having to prove that there was force. And how do you prove that there's force? Well, force is only as strong as what it's up against, right? And so you suddenly get grown people having argument like arguments about, are her fingernails ripped off enough, right? And that is just so gruesome. Um, there are some states kind of doing it right, like the state of New Jersey has got really elegantly written sexual assault um, laws, but yeah, so, you know, that's the battle. And, and the PACE exam is expensive. They're like $800 or $900. You, you hear people refer to them as rape kits. Um, and so there's actually lots of backlogs across America. And um, Mariska Hargaday uh, from Law & Order SVU, she actually has a great nonprofit called the Joyful Heart Foundation. And their mission is to um, like raise funds to pay for and just end the backlog. So uh, if anyone's hearing this and thinking like, that's totally my issue, you can definitely check out the Joyful Heart Foundation to kind of you know help on that front. And to kind of step outside the movie real quick, yeah. we uh, we recently did a video on here that reviewed another of the genre blast uh -huh. uh, films called Apps, and uh, we do a thing called Mental Health Moment where we uh -huh. will take a piece of uh, mental health that is that the film focuses on and kind of expand upon that, yeah. and uh, kind of how to walk that out practically. Uh -huh. But to kind of step outside of that, um, I say that because there's a portion of that film that deals very highly with sexual assault. And uh -huh. uh, we recently, uh, part of the, the statistics for sexual assault is that uh, only 25 out of every 1,000 uh, perpetrators actually see the inside of a cell or actually find sentencing. Do you, would you find or say that that is because of those practices that we have with uh, terminology and also expense? Um. Yes, and also I would like to clarify that that's just the ones that are reporting. Yeah. So if you take into account the ones that are not reporting, that means that 0.2% of 
of all acts of sexual violence result in any kind of criminal charge, um, which is bananas. Um, sorry, what was the half, second half of the question? I forget. Would you say that that because of like the legality terminology and also the expense, would you say that that's the reason why we see those low numbers so low? Yes, definitely. Those are contributing factors. Um, also the way that we process the cases. So, you know, psychologists should be involved with writing the language of the officers while they, like, very first gather information on the cases with the survivor. Um, because I think you get these such low reported numbers because it is such a re-traumatization. And so if we were to rethink the way that we um, process the crime, as the survivor reports, I think that those numbers have probably come up too. And so kind of to bring it back to the movie, one of the things that you guys do really well in this is you explore the mental health uh, trauma, as you've been saying, of everything that follows it. And I'm curious, like, the journey of actually, like, writing the script, like, how was kind of, how was that on your own mental health? Because this film deals with such heavy... Uh, themes like did you guys have to kind of like take breaks and kind of come back to it? Wow, you know, I think a lot about mental health of like actors and performers, especially on horror sets. Emma and I were so passionate about the story that I feel like there was enough space between the performance and the production that there was breathing room. So, you know, Emma was a producer on the film. And so when she wasn't acting, she was doing a, t a titan of a job um, pr producing and putting together the production. So I kind of feel like there was more space than usual between performance and and like her own you know relationship to the material. So I feel like we were set up for success for both Emma and I to like run the wrong the long haul because of how much additional duty we were doing that that wasn't directly related to the material so you know I, I think that that probably helped sustain like just how far we can run and I think that's helped us stick with it for five years. So much of the material uh, I would say really captures the fear and the terror of uh, what it's like to go through an assault and I think that it's, it's very accurate and also kind of the process afterwards, uh, like the grieving process or of, of the events and kind of the trauma, the healing process. Uh, how did you guys kind of go about making that as accurate? So we did a lot of research. Um, we tried to find as many accounts as we could possibly find. And then we sort of synthesized them into one story. And we really wanted to make Jane somebody who we would be friends with, but also we loaded the deck so that there were 101 reasons why someone who didn't have a lot in common with her might not believe her. And it was really important to us that we'd have a character who, you know, had a good sex life. She was in a, she partied like she wanted to. She lived life like she wanted to. Um, so you weren't seeing like some kind of very pure, perfect victim because I think that that's a lot of the problem is we have this idea of like, oh no, you know, virginity was taken from her, like, as if that's the big problem versus, like, someone assaulted this person, you know, so I think a lot of that, you know, puritanical ideology and sex is sort of built into how we view victims and how we judge their, their story. Can you talk about the decision to make our protagonist a social media influencer? Yeah, so actually that came sort of after, so we had a cut of the movie like I said, we've been working on it for five years, and we were uh, sitting in the edit bay when the Ronan Farrow story broke on Harvey Weinstein, and the hashtag MeToo, you know, at the same time was emerging, and I was like, we gotta go back. We gotta go back and add in social media, because now this is a huge piece of the conversation. And honestly, it really was where women and survivors in general were finding each other and finding some kind of support online. And so, it felt like, okay, well, if it's going to be in the story, it has to be directly tied to Jane. And so that, that kind of came in, in, that's sort of how we arrived at having Jane be a social media influencer. And it's also interesting how you guys use social media for her healing process, 
as kind of almost therapy. Yeah, I mean, isn't that so interesting? Because social media is, it's, it's everything, right? It's where you can go and share your story most authentically, but it's also where you can go and manufacture what your life might look like, right? So people are distrustful of it, but it's also a place where people get really raw. And so for Jane, as she's an artist, and so I think part of her process is she's just like shouting into the void looking for any sort of connection. And so she turns to social media, as I think most of us do. And I think one of the most heartbreaking aspects of that is the social media usage in this movie, because uh, there's a scene where the sister um, has, is just kind of like, she walks in to Jane's apartment and sees that like there's this live stream that she had done. And then she's just going through like all of these like really heartbreaking comments about like how people really don't believe her and uh, I think that that's just captured really well. Oh thanks yeah I was like all right we got to really write some gross stuff so I actually cruised through in, in, through YouTube and found like specific language you know like so that the comments of her being sexualized are like copy pastes from other you know ch channels on the internet. That's really heartbreaking to hear. It's completely disgusting yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that uh, I, probably my favorite line in this entire movie comes from the sister, where she's talking to Jane, and she's talking specifically about how she needs to, like, have her own healing, and not rely on, like, other people's, like, social media, but, like, you have to, like, actually, like, take time to heal for yourself, and I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about the importance of uh, self-care. Yeah, so I mean the sister is right, but she's also, you know, wrong in the sense that Jane is doing that for herself. Um, and the sister, I think, um, personifies where most of us find ourselves when a friend is processing trauma or a loved one is processing trauma. Of like, well, you're not doing this how I thought I would do it in my head, so therefore something must be off. Um, but I think that the sister is, her heart is in the right place, but I do think that she's sort of inflicting on Jane her own expectation of what it looks like to perform victimhood. Yeah, so let's let's get a little bit spooky. Yeah, let's get spooky. Uh, not that we haven't been talking about some horror already. Yeah, real life horror, but spooky horror is more fun. Yeah, so this movie, you talked about how you guys kind of went back and like retooled it after the Weinstein twist. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, did the monster ever change in that time? Oh man, the monster's been such an ongoing process um, of development. In the end, the, all the effects that you see, uh, there are close to 300 FX shots. They were all done by a singular VFX artist named Shanley Barnett, and she's killer. She's like so punk rock. She was down to do things like super down and dirty, indie style. I think she did a phenomenal job making us look like we were a giant movie. Um, she had so many ideas that she had rendered into the, the monster, and by the time that I was working with her, we were already pretty far along in like the development of it. Um, at, you know, the, the core of the monster is it's something that escapes the describable because you can never quite get people to fully believe you. So, you know, you, you have t a hard time putting your own finger on what it is that you're seeing. And it is a dark force that just has, sort of has like the arms of death sort of kind of coming for you. And so that was sort of the initial concept. And I think that we stuck to that pretty well and just built on it and added so much more than I ever thought we would be able to add to it. Yeah, the monster definitely develops with the story, which is something, and then once you kind of like, actually you're able to see it in final form, it yeah. it's it's baffling. Like, I, I want a freeze frame of it just to like study it. Yeah. Uh, I think you guys did a really great job with it, the monster design though. Oh, thank you so much. The, the puppet, the, the so it's animated by a dancer named Karina Kinnear. She's a fantastic dancer choreography. She developed a huge language behind the movement of the monster. The puppet itself was built by Ch Chelsea Pickens. She's a puppet artist and a costume artist. And the FX, practical FX makeup was done by Lawrence Mercado. And he had made like these really cool silicone molds that he used to use like the dead skin that's on the monster's arms. He did the mouth, like he had sprayed this like black paint inside of the dancer's mouth. And um, it was really kind of a joint a joint effort. But yeah, I, was, I, was, I thought the monster was really neat. Can you kind of talk about the symbolism of the monster? Oh man, well, I think the monster is whatever you need it to be when you're watching the movie, you know. I, I've had people have wildly different takes on, you know, what is the monster, what does it represent, and I feel like it is darkness, and it's coming for you, and it is surrounded 
by a harbinger of, uh, you know, it's surrounded by flies and flies swarm around dead things or sweet things or rotting things. And it is sort of like how everybody sort of swarms around Jane, right? Like they all kind of descend on her own story with their own ideas and their own expectations and they sort of add complication to her to her story. So whatever it is that you're processing, whatever it is that's chasing you, I think that it's safe to say that the monster could personify it. Whether it is victim blaming itself for actual assault or whatever it is like you, know, you want to call it, I think that it's safe to, you know, draw those conclusions. Yeah, I'm so glad that you had you had put it in that capacity because I really kind of had this, uh, like, I, I kept going back and forth with, like, what I personally believed the monster was. Yeah. And kind of hearing how you talked about how it's, like, it's symbolism and it's kind of its own unique thing. Like, it's going to go to multiple different things. I think it's really awesome. Yeah, I love watching movies that I can, I love the movies. I, I want to be at the movies all day long. I want to go with friends. I want to sit afterwards and talk about them. So I wanted to make a movie that would be an invitation to a conversation that people were maybe not feeling like they were comfortable having because it's a lot easier to talk about a monster than it is to talk about sexual assault and I, I really want people to come together and talk about it in their own communities so I was I'm glad that you felt the invitation to you know and make your own inferences about the monster because that's definitely the intention. What's interesting too is that like the more that you uh, you know talk about it the more the less like the less stigma it is around it and I feel like with a film like Take Back the Night it's really easy to specifically address uh, themes of sexual assault and violence and even uh, there are some themes in, of suicide here as well. Yes, oh yes, um, you know we have an end title card about the National Suicide Hotline. Um, to anybody experiencing thoughts of suicide, time is your friend. Reach out to a, anything that you can do to buy yourself 10 seconds, uh, a minute, uh, 30 minutes, do it. Watch your favorite show, call your best friend, go for a walk, time is your friend. So to um, anybody also helping anybody uh, with thoughts of suicide, I can't stress this enough time. You, you need time. Just put time between them and the thought. Um, yeah. Also, if you guys are watching this, uh, click the links in the description to check out our mental health resource library. It's the heartbeat of why we create this content. Uh, just a couple more questions for you. Yeah, please. Um, there's specifically one of the last shots, and I, I love this shot. It's not a spoiler in any way, but obviously her journey ends up being coming a hashtag called Monsters Are Real. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that uh, she clicks on it and she kind of goes through Instagram and there's like these like crescent moon. I kind of, can you talk about the symbology of that? Yeah, so um, this is a little bit of spoilers for anyone who doesn't want spoilers. Um, part of the injury the monster inflicts is a moon shaped scar on her wrist. And um, and I don't know whether or not to include this, but I'll tell you. Um, so the monster, you know, injects, sticks their finger in Jane's wrist and injects a paralytic and makes a sweeping motion to do it. And so anybody who's experienced this monster has the same scar. Um, and we all have fundamentally the same scar, you know, from sexual violence, even if it looks different, you know, across everybody's bodies, which is, you know, I play with that with the detective not, not being sure about Jane's scar. And then we sort of learned the detective's connection to the scar herself. Um, and and so the, the symbolism on, on Instagram of, you know, these scars is just people sort of owning it, sort of like they did hashtag me too, just standing up and being captain, like, hey, this is a real problem and we're looking for visibility here. And so, yeah, so we just sort of thought it'd be fun to, you know, I love, I grew up on punk music. I idolized the Riot Girls, Kathleen Hanna, Hagar, um, that, that kind of era of film and, or sorry, of music. And they, a huge thing that they did was they used Sharpies on their hands, like to draw stars and to just like be visible. Like we're young women and we've got something political to say, but we're still gonna put hearts over our eyes and do it in a very um, feminine way. And so I was kind of drawing on that too, of like drawing on your own body with Sharpies to sort of say something political. Yeah. It's, it's great. It's it's one of like the most um, I want to say satisfying shots in the entire movie because it really demonstrates that you're not alone. And so when you go through things, something like sexual assault or sexual violence or even depression, like it just takes one person to say like 
I've experienced this and then kind of like sweeping a whole movement along too. Yeah, I think it's why the two of me too is powerful. It's like, yes, I am part of this with you. You know, it's my support groups are powerful. And so anybody kind of going through processing sexual violence or processing whatever trauma, I really hope that they can carve out a safe space to connect with anybody who, who might relate to them. And yeah, it's funny because I uh, was trying to get temporary tattoos made in time for the festival of the crescent so people can stick them on their wrists, but maybe down the road. If I give you my address, will you send me one? Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> send you guys a couple for your... Yes, I, I totally want. We'll, maybe we'll do a giveaway. Oh, that would be great, yeah. Because I really love this film, and so my last question is, uh, obviously this film is currently doing the festival circuit. Where can people find uh, where it's going to be next and follow you guys online? Yeah, so we are on Instagram, Take Back the Night Movie, and I think that that's my hashtag. I should check. You guys, I have to tell you, since we're talking about mental health, <laughs> Social media is not good for my mental health. Sure. Two years ago, I came completely off of it, and I have to say I don't miss it at all, but I am a little bit of a dinosaur that I can't even remember. Yeah, Take Back the Night movie. Okay. Uh, we'll provide a link in the descriptions where you guys are currently watching this. Uh, make sure that you guys check this movie out. It is probably one of the most important films that 2021 has given us. I thank you so much for your time and so much for your art and the truth that it's telling. I, you know, it means the world to me to have this kind of reception. Thanks so much for giving me a platform and for amplifying voices about mental health. I think it's so awesome. I think there are so many filmmakers kind of uh, doing the duty of an artist and exploring the space. And so the fact that you guys have an entire dedicated outlet to spotlighting those films and also providing mental health resources is really awesome. Thank you for sharing space with me. I really appreciate it. Yes. Make sure that you guys take, uh, check out Take Back the Night wherever you guys come from and uh maybe hopefully soon fingers crossed it'll be coming to uh blu-ray dvd and streaming services yeah we've got some things in the works so maybe just follow our instagram and wait for an announcement fingers crossed all right thank you guys